on This Week in Enterprise Tech. We're getting legally cloudy in the enterprise. Chibert shows off some toys. Oh, and by the way, we tell you all about using previously loved gear in your enterprise network. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 50, recorded April 12th, 2013 for July 15, 2013. I got 99 problems, but this switch ain't one. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, a powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code ENTERPRISE. And by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all sizes with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP Solutions. Visit techserve.com slash twiet and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. And by Stash, an Atlassian product. Stash offers behind the firewall Git management for your source code. Secure, fast, and enterprise grade. To learn more about Stash and try it free for 30 days, visit Atlassian.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balliser, although for the video viewers, I don't look very fathery right now. That's because Delta decided my clothes should go on a vacation. They're currently in Minnesota. I am, of course, joined by a fantastic panel, starting with the man to my right. That's right, he's not on the islands anymore. We've brought him, maybe... Too soon, we should not have brought him. But this is Mr. Brian Chi, the evangelist from Thin Links. Brian, welcome to the Brick House. Yeah, it's actually been almost a full year since I've been here, according to Foursquare. That's right, exactly. Yeah, I think the last time you were in this Brick House was when Leo offered me the job. Yeah, I was in the audience and learning all about what Twit was. Yeah, exactly. And now you know, and knowing is half the battle. And of course, knowing is half the battle for the other member of my panel, and that is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Enterprise Efficiency. Curtis, still in Florida. We have not yet flown you over to the Brick House, but how are you today? Looking forward to making it to the Brick House at some point, but uh, enjoying another beautiful sunny day here in the swamp. Yes, swamp. And by the way, I, I know exactly how you feel. It was 94 degrees in D.C. yesterday when I flew out, and it was snowing in Minneapolis, so I, I don't know what's going on. But let's get right to it because we've got a action-packed, full-packed episode of Twilight, starting with our Enterprise Byte. We have touched on this story before, and that is the legally cloudy issue that is enterprise in the cloud, be it public or private. Uh, we've got an article here from CIO that talks about how enterprises are starting to realize that the take it or leave it non-service level agreement service that they get from most cloud companies just isn't cutting it in corporate America. Now, there are two major concerns here. The first is if they lose connectivity, if they lose the ability to access their data, they've realized there's no real legal ramifications to the provider. They can't really go out and say, well, uh, you know, you cost us $10 million for the business because the cloud provider can look at their, their end user license agreements and say, we, well, we, we promised you best effort, not necessarily a, a five nines experience. The other part is the privacy concerns. And that is, even if you're hosting in a private cloud, you are still hosting on someone else's server, in someone else's rack, in someone else's colo. And uh, there are all sorts of legal issues about what kind of privacy you're guaranteed. Chibert, let me throw this to you. You saw this. You saw this a long time ago. You, you basically said, unless these providers can sort out their legal stuff, well, that uh, it's going to slow adoption in the enterprise. Is that what we're now seeing? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think there's going to be along the lines of, you know, gee, telephone systems. Oh, it'll never catch on. You know, no, the telcos have been able to provide five nines of reliability for decades and decades. But now the cloud providers are going to have to step up. They've always been this best effort. Oh, gee, that's good enough. Well, 
I'm sorry, it's not going to be good enough. You're trying to push everybody into the cloud. I'm a big uh, supporter of cloud technology, but we really need to step up a bit. We need to at least get to three nines. Uh, and just keep in mind, that's not that bad. You know, you don't have that much outage in three nines of reliability. Yeah, yeah. Now, Curtis, I want to throw over to you because this is one of these things that maybe the average user doesn't understand. Because when we think of a cloud outage, we think, okay, Netflix isn't accessible for a few hours, maybe up to a day. We think Amazon's S3 has gone down and maybe some of my most popular social sharing services like Foursquare are not accessible for a few hours. It's different for an, an enterprise. Tell me, what is the nightmare scenario of an enterprise hosting their data in either a public or private cloud and then having that access go away? Well, the nightmare scenario is just what you said, that the data will in fact go away, that you have so much data out there in the cloud that has not been backed up to another source so that should something happen to that cloud provider, whether it be a, a physical outage or legal action or sudden bankruptcy, that you'll lose critical data that you need to continue your day-to-day -day operations. That's the sort of thing that both SLAs and offsite backup for your cloud data is designed to get around. And we're seeing more and more companies that are addressing those issues in the SLAs that they are requiring any cloud provider to sign before they'll actually do business. Right. Something else out of this article was uh, a list of things that should be considered during an enterprise's due diligence when deciding whether or not to use the cloud. I, I want to read them really quickly. There's six points. The first is, why are we thinking of a public cloud? What are the trade-offs vis-a-vis storing the data on site versus in the cloud? Two, what kind of data are we putting into the cloud? Is it personally identifiable or sensitive? Three, where are the servers located? What privacy laws govern those jurisdictions? Four, how is the data stored and transmitted? Will it be encrypted? Five, who has access to the data? How is it physically protected? And six, how quickly will we, will, will we be notified if there's a breach? Uh, now, Chibbert, I'm going to throw it back to you. Looking at these six, can you think of anything else, or does this pretty well encapsulate what an enterprise should look at when they're even considering putting their proprietary data up in the cloud? I think one of the problems with these, these are all really good points, but um, one of the interop guys actually brought up a really interesting point. He threw some data up into the cloud, in this case, Amazon S3, and then when he had to pull it back down, it was coming back from Italy. Um, with the things like publishing laws and uh, a lot of the federal research or um, health research, it can't leave the country. So one of the things that you really need to start taking a good hard look at in your SLA is, will your data leave the country? Uh, pretty important, when it, especially when it comes to research. Yeah. Curtis, let me throw over to you because one of the promises of cloud-based storage or cloud-based services is that they are, well, they're located everywhere. We spread out the load. So if I have a global enterprise and I have branch offices on every corner of the globe, it makes it possible for me to have decent performance to those different branches. But on the other hand, the legal ramification is now that I've taken that data and I've thrown it into data centers across the world, that data is now, well, it, it, it can be under the jurisdiction of several different types of privacy laws. Have enterprises caught on to that yet, or is that still sort of uh, off in the future? Well, one of the things that you're seeing is a subtle, or perhaps not so subtle, shift in the definition of the cloud. Uh, originally, what you just described was absolutely true and was part of the intrinsic definition of the cloud, the idea that you didn't know or care where the data storage or processing was happening. What I'm seeing from a lot more enterprises now is that they are focusing their definition of the cloud on two key issues, demand elasticity and on-demand provisioning. That means that you're able to expand and contract the service offering or the storage capacity to meet demand on a day-to-day -day or even hour-by-hour -hour basis. And users are able to self-provision the, the storage units or the processing capability that they need. You'll notice that the piece that's gone from that is the 
data stored everywhere piece. That's why we're seeing more and more companies that are going to agreements that look much more like the traditional rack space type co-location or information service provisioning contracts rather than the public cloud contracts we're used to. And this is important because where we're seeing this split is between what consumers think of as the cloud and what enterprises think of as the cloud. Consumers still don't want to know where and how the service is happening. Enterprises increasingly absolutely do want to know where those things are happening. They just want that elasticity and on-demand provisioning to go with it. With that shift in definition, we're seeing them draw up contracts that address a lot of these regulatory and legal issues. And much of this, to be honest, is in response to the very regulatory and legal issues that have been such big stumbling blocks for cloud adoption. Right, I like that. Now, all of the discussion that we have had so far has really been about the legal ramifications of having your data spread across the cloud or in different servers in different jurisdictions. There is another aspect to that, and that's something that we here on Twite have gone in depth to several, several times, starting with, if you remember back to the Supreme Court case, the South Carolina Supreme Court, on the Stored Communications Act, the 1986 Stored SCA, Stored Communications Act. They were talking about the Jennings versus Jennings case, where the Supreme Court of South Carolina made a decision saying that data abandoned on an email server was not protected. Then we went from there to a, uh, a filing by the United States Department of Justice when they were trying to go after Kim.com, uh, Kim where they basically said data in the cloud does not belong to its users. They were able to seize the servers because they weren't seizing user data. They were seizing the physical hardware uh, that was the server, and the data just came along with it. And then we had the third part where we had Google saying no to warrantless cloud searches, which was in contravention of the 1986 Stored Communications Act. So this has been a battle that has been brewing for a while in the enterprise. It's not well known because only outlets like Twyet have picked up on it. But Chebert, my question to you is, with those stories slowly developing, this, this consciousness of the issues surrounding privacy of proprietary data and whether or not it is actually protected as physical data is protected, if it were, say, on a spreadsheet, well, what kind of effect will that happen uh, have on enterprises trying to adopt cloud services, cloud storage? Well, uh, I, I went on the rant when we first started talking about this, about how it could potentially kill a multi-trillion dollar industry all around the world. And, you know, the there has been some cases where you've seen people putting data centers on ships, data centers on old oil rigs and so forth. Um, if the U.S. government decides to keep going on this route, we're, what we're probably going to start seeing is more and more of these showing up. And it's just going to make it next to impossible for the FBI to actually do their job or whoever. So there needs to be a balance here. And the balance really needs to be, come on, let's get a little more realistic about you know, what can be seized with and without a warrant. Otherwise, sooner or later, it's all going to move offshore and the U.S. is going to lose yet another giant industry. Curtis, when Chibert went off on his rant not too long ago, you took a more measured tone and you were, you were hopeful that the federal government would be able to figure out the privacy concerns. Given that there hasn't really been that much movement, and here we are, again, talking about a story in which we're seeing decreased confidence by the enterprise, do you, do you still hold to that? Do you think they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to make this work, or is this sort of a lost cause? Well, I don't know that I would call it a lost cause, but I will say that I think that from the government perspective, there's no real excitement, no real impetus for them to go ahead and solve this problem, especially with things like sequester and all the other things. Most departments, most uh, bureaus and divisions feel that they have, frankly, bigger fish to fry. That's why I think you're seeing the enterprises take it upon themselves to go through this subtle redefinition of the cloud. They're dealing with it in their relationships with the cloud providers so that they don't have to wait on the federal government. Um, we're seeing more and more SLAs 
start to be written and crafted. And I think what we're seeing is that outside of the consumer market, more and more cloud providers are willing to go into these SLA agreements with the enterprises. Right now, we're seeing what I would call the first round of maturity in the cloud world. We don't know where it's going to end up, but what we're seeing is a group of necessary steps to take cloud from that era of great promise into something that more and more IT departments feel comf comfortable and confident in using. Um, one of the things that I hear at the conferences I go to is that cloud is no longer an option. It's becoming the standard way of doing business. For it to be the standard way of doing business, it really has to have the assurances that the ID department needs, and those are coming out through the contractual agreements rather than anything the government is or isn't doing. All right. Java678 in the chat room has a really good point. Uh, first of all, he brings up the cause of Aaron Schwartz, but he also says, well, is an SLA binding with the FBI? Achiever, we've been talking about the agreements that you can make with your provider, but ultimately, if the FBI comes to a cloud provider and says, we want this server, this hard drive, nothing really can stop them, right? Yeah, well, except when you've got a provider that's big, say, you know, like our friends at Google, and I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder here. When you have a corporation that big, they, there's no reason why they can't dig their heels in and say, on behalf of our customers, go to heck until <laughs> you get me a warrant. And that warrant had better hold up because we're going to have our lawyers here. And um, let's go see who pushes harder. Right, which is what we saw in that part three. I, uh, I briefly mentioned it, that part three story where Google said, no, uh, uh, we're not going to turn over emails to you just because they're older than 180 days. Google has essentially said, we think the SCA, the Stored Communications Act, is out of date, and therefore we want something that is a bit more relevant to what we're doing today before we turn over customer information with uh, just a nod from the FBI. I, I think the... Uh, the the key word here is that uh, enterprises need to be wary. It's, it's sort of enterprise beware when you're dealing with the cloud. Oh, I'm sure we're going to come back to this because we seem to circle around every couple of weeks. But uh, for now, let's, let's put it to bed because, well, I've got a headache. Now, coming up right after the jump, we're going to be talking about how to get the most bang for your buck if you're deploying a new enterprise class network. But for that, let's take a word from our sponsors. Experienced enterprise users know that you need to meet with your team for success. You have to see each other face to face. You have to hear their ideas. You have to let the creative juices flow. But now in the summer, when we all want to be outside, we all want to be with friends and family, we all want to be away from the office, collaboration is often not the easiest thing to do. That's why we use GoToMeeting with Citrix. It's the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate online, even in the summer. Now, GoToMeeting with HD Faces gives your team the ability to share the same screen. It makes it easier to be on the same page when you can actually see the same page. And you just turn on your webcam to turn your meeting into a face-to-face, high-definition video conference. You can collaborate like you're in the same room. That means you can see people's facial gestures. You can see if they're frowning, if they're smiling, if they get it. It's really that simple. It's so easy to launch or join a meeting from anywhere using your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Heck, you can even present from your iPad. Now, I talk a lot about GoToMeeting. And that's because I actually use GoToMeeting. It's one of these products that I use on a daily basis. You see, my job right now has me in D.C. flying around the world. And let me tell you, that just takes its toll. It's expensive. It takes up a lot of time. And, well, I'm just not that young anymore. Now, when someone told me that I could use GoToMeeting to get rid of some, if not all, of those flights and keep the same level of communication, well, I, I had to try it. And let me tell you, what I found is that it's even better. Now I can be refreshed. I can be rested. I can be ready to go. And I can meet with 12 different teams in 12 different parts of the world all on the same day without having to step foot in an airport. It's how I like to do business because I like to do business efficiently. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to try GoToMeeting and see what it might do for your workflow. You can try it free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code ENTERPRISE. Remember, use the promo code ENTERPRISE. GoToMeeting, meeting is believing, 
and we thank Citrix for their support of this week in enterprise tech. And we're back. The Twit Brick House is absolutely bursting open with a cornucopia of guests. We couldn't put them all here on the Twiat desk, so we put them on the TNT stat. We're starting with Miss Gillian. We call her Gilly Canty Ross. She, uh, well, she's the, I, I'm going to call you the, the queen of subspace communications. Uh, uh, G Gilly, can you tell us what you do? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a reseller of networking equipment. I basically take the equipment, I check it myself, I send it out, and I make sure it's all working and happy, and then I put a warranty on it, and basically that's it. It sounds really simple, but it's actually quite complicating. So joining her is another one of her interop cohorts. That's Gerard Butler from Network Hardware Resale. Gerard, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, can you tell us who you are and, and who you represent? I am a solutions architect for Network Hardware Resale, a leading provider of uh, pre-owned uh, networking equipment and IT solutions. And uh, so I work in our professional services de um, department and I help, um, you know, both on the design front and in the uh, support front uh, to ensure that our customers get the service and support that um, they deserve. By the way, I, I once again called you Gerard Butler, which is weird because I've known you for three years now. That's Gerard Powers, by the way. Okay, Thank so you. we've brought you in because we're talking about a, uh, a very interesting topic, and that is, can you trust used equipment in the enterprise? Let's call it what it is. You, you're, both of you have companies that are based around the model of taking gear that has been previously loved, reconditioning it, testing it, and then reselling it for, uh, for a profit. Now, my first question, and I'm going to throw this over to you first, Gerard, is... What kind of savings can we expect if we start using previously loved gear? It's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. Um, the savings can be, you know, tremendous. And, you know, you'd be looking at upwards of 80% 80 per, 80 in some examples um, or more. So, really, you want to take a look at what you're going to save, you know, on the hardware, but also in the long term on a, you know, maintenance and support perspective as well because, a lot of times um, OEMs will make more money on support, so hardware looks attractive, and then you know in the long run you get burned on support. So that's another thing that uh, providers uh, like ourselves offer to ensure that the customer post-sale gets a sustainable offering uh, to support their IT infrastructure. Right. Gilly, let me go over to you and, and ask you this. So what typically would I be able to save? Let's say I'm deploying a, a, a medium-sized enterprise, a thousand seats, and I need to replace a rack of, of switches. And typically I'd be paying, let's say, $100,000 for those switches in aggregate. What would moving to recondition gear do for my bottom line? Of course, it depends on the equipment and how new it is, how recently it's come out. But Typically, it would be probably between 50 and 80 percent. I, um, I worked up some numbers for a 6500. If you get a 6500 with an S S720 processor, 48 ports of fast Ethernet, and 16 ports of 10 gig, with SmartNet, it comes to brand new, $70,443.96. And if you purchased it pre-owned, you could buy it for $26,383. Now, keep in mind that you can get two and a half systems, that's two and a half of these whole systems for less than you would pay for new with a support contract. And that was just eight by five by next business days. And most resellers will offer advanced replacements anyway, so you'd get your hardware by the next day anyway. Right, right. Gerard, let me go back over to you. Sure. Uh, put yourself on the other side of the table. As a, an IT manager, someone who's doing a big deployment, why would I always default to the new gear? And let's, let's get this out in the open. What is the allure of having factory fresh, you know, all in its bubble wrap, all with its, its, uh, its factory original warranty? If the savings are going to be that great, don't you think, that as as, uh, as Gidley has recommended, you'd buy two and a half or, or three of the devices for the same price as the one? Well, it, it goes back to people's, you know, preconceived notions of what they're actually comfortable with. 
And, you know, we're always comfortable, you know, in our culture with something, you know, new. We know, you know, we think we know where it comes from. We know the, you know, support and the, you know, caveats that come with it. And we're comfortable with that. And so it's a, it's a little bit of, you know, as the IT manager, you know, you're responsible for the network and, you know, it's, you feel a lot of pressure. So sometimes you're a little hesitant to, um, you know, go with something that you're not familiar with. But I think once you see the facts, in addition to the savings, and you see the, as um, Gilly mentioned, the guarantees, the warranties that come with it, you soon realize that you're not risking anything at all. You're actually making a, you know, a very smart decision and an economically sound decision by switching your network um, and, you know, buying these different products and, and um, support alternatives. Right, right. And so probably saving somebody's job while you're at it. Yeah, we're all about saving jobs. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm actually a customer of Jilly, and, you know, the equipment that she sold me has worked great. And besides, what really is a warranty? It is a corporation backing that equipment saying that if it didn't work quite right, we'll replace it or we'll have it fixed. You're just giving the customer some warm and fuzzy saying, we're going to stand behind it because that's really what a warranty is. Right. right. There's also the, um, the problem with what they call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, the, man, the OEMs will come in and say, well, this isn't authorized equipment. It's gray market. It could be fake. And they scare the customers, and that's not right either. So we have to go in and prove ourselves over and over and over again, whereas the OEMs have already proven themselves and have scared the pants off of the customer. Yeah, yeah. Now, Chibert, let me ask you this. Bring me through a typical enterprise deployment cycle. Let's, so again, let's let's take that hypothetical 5,000 seat enterprise. They've got a bank of, well, I'm, I'm gonna call it what it is. They've got a bank of Cisco switches and the Cisco switches have a warranty of three years. They've got a service contract for three years. Typically, what would happen as you approach the end of that service contract? Well, realistically, at the end of that service contract, you're either going to think about replacing them or you're just going to cross your fingers and say, well, let's see if we can get one or two more years and maybe, just maybe, uh, I'll go and see if I can afford a few spares. Well, with used equipment, it's the exact same thing. And as long as you don't let some, you know, the ma original equipment manufacturer badger you into thinking that just because it's used, I can't put it under service contract, uh, use your leverage, say, hey, I want a service contract. It's your equipment. It's just a few years older. Does that mean that uh, if someone has a um, switch, they've bought it, they forget to put it in a contract, and a year later after, after it's out of warranty, that you're not going to warrant that? You're not going to let him buy an extended warranty? It's the exact same thing. You know, it's all, you know, brand X. I like that. Gerard, let me go over to you, and I, I want to ask you a question. That I, I don't want to be mean, but if I'm an enterprise manager, why would I consider going with used gear? Uh, let's say my job's on the line. Again, remember, we're all about saving jobs. My job's on the line if I buy half a million dollars worth of gear and it has a much higher than normal failure rate because I decided to go with reconditioned gear. So in my mind it doesn't make sense for me to, to try another solution, even if it's gonna be a third of the cost. What, what needs to change? What's the mindset shift that needs to happen? What do you need to convince customers of before they're willing to, to make that jump? Well, I think that we have to stop thinking of it as just a transaction and instead a long-term relationship. So you are partnering with us or you know, with another similar organization and we're gonna have your back. We're gonna offer you, you know, the support options to fit your, you know, your requirements and give you the comfort level that you need to be able to sleep at night. And uh, it's not just a, hey, we sold it to you. Hey, great, see you later. It's something, it's a very long-term relationship that we're interested in working with you to give you the confidence and, you know, to give you the comfort that, you know, that when you buy with us or you work with us or you integrate our hardware and solutions that you're not gonna worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things that I wanna bring up is that a lot of these resellers that are authorized resellers selling you brand new equipment, those extended service contracts aren't necessarily from the manufacturer of that gear. Sometimes it's from that large reseller. 
and sometimes they're not even really turning in that uh, extended service plan so that if the gear goes to some other reseller you have no warranty um, and that happens on new gear so there's really no difference with used gear um, in my case I was able to buy twice as many routers for my router class that I would have been able to if I had to buy it new so for academia it certainly makes a heck of a lot of sense yeah. uh, Gilly I, I want to throw uh, something at you a while back, I was doing some work for one of our institutions, and we received a truckload of gear. It was relatively new. It was within that model year, but it was overstock. They couldn't sell it as new. They, you, uh, as new. they could not sell it with the service contract. But we're talking about gear that had never actually been plugged in. It was gear that never had been used, gear that had never even seen a configuration. We're talking about new in box and yet, because of the way the enterprise works and because they all want a service contract and they all want their new gear, we got this gear for our nonprofit because there was no one else willing to use it. How prevalent is that, uh, is that thinking in the enterprise? Well, I believe that if, if they don't, if the equipment doesn't have a contract on it already, it's considered... It, uh, it's considered used for the most part. Generally, we don't sell new equipment because that would imply that it's eligible for Cisco SmartNet or Juniper contracts. And only Cisco and Juniper can, can authorize those contracts and they do not like people like us. All right, uh, Curtis, I wanna throw you into the mix here because you actually do represent the enterprise here. What do you think about what we've been talking about? Is the enterprise willing to, to, to bet on reconditioned gear or is it going to stick to that old mindset? You know, no one ever got fired for buying Cisco. No one ever got fired for having something from the manufacturer with the service contract. I think there are a number of variables in this. Uh, I think for many purposes, uh, the used market is a place where most enterprises would be absolutely happy to go, especially if they can build that support relationship where they feel confident that should there be an issue, there's someone they can call to get results. Now, the places where things get interesting are for large enterprises who are looking for what I'll call their core. Uh, those are much like more likely to, uh, to go to a manufacturer the other side, though, is that those are much more likely, especially in a very large enterprise, to get substantial discounts, uh, the kind of discounts that can really reduce the delta in price between new and used. Um, once you get out of that core stack, though, I think that you're seeing a lot of companies being very happy to look at reputable, reliable, secondhand or used resellers uh, to provide what they need for a number of places in their deployment. Uh, this is especially true as they're looking to put things out in the field or in a lot of different locations around the country. Gerardo, let me throw over to you. Uh, we've got a question from the chat room from Dr. T. Uh, he writes, price-wise, how does the warranty cost, so your service compared to a new purchase from someone like HP, Dell, IBM, etc., uh, he, in other words, he's trying to separate the hardware costs from the service costs, the contract costs. Do you, do you have a breakdown of that? You know, it's a great question. Um, and the bottom line is that our service costs are still going to be lower than the OEM. So you're buying hardware that's, you know, at a price that's lower than the OEM. And then you're buying a service contract that is also substantially lower than the OEM as well. So it's not one of those things where, oh, yeah, we got you in on the hardware and, and we real, really got you on the so service or support. You know, we're giving you a break on both of them. Um, so that that's, hope yeah. that answers the question. NHR has their own, they have their own maintenance company. Is that correct? That's right. We have our own um, third-party maintenance product called NetSure. Mm -hmm. And what that offers is everything from, you know, your eight by, you know, standard, next standard, standard next business day offering replacement up to, you know, either an on-site spare or a four-hour uh, spare that can be deployed uh, by staging it in various depots around the world. So depending on your comfort level in terms of what SLA you need for that replacement, you know, we have an offering to support that. Uh, was it Mr. T who asked the question? Uh, Dr. T, Dr. I believe. Dr. T. Yes. 
Um, Dr. T, I did some research on the 6509, what the smart net would cost, and for it ranged anywhere from $5,416.99 to $11,889 for one year. Yeah, so that's a nice breakdown. Uh, actually, Gillian, let me ask you another question, because... Again, I don't want to take it easy on you. I, I don't Please want to don't. feel as if uh, as if we're we're going to softball this. There will be those who say, "Well, how can I trust X company that is selling me reconditioned hardware? Aren't they just going to throw whatever it is they want to get rid of? They've got a warehouse full of of ABC product, so therefore they're going to try to tell me ABC is the product I should I should get. Wouldn't it be better if I went to a reputable original manufacturer and said, what kind of products do I need? How would you answer that? Well, personally, what I do is I have no loyalty to any one manufacturer. If someone says I need a 48 port switch, I'm going to give them two or three options that I think will work best in their network. If you go to the OEM, they're going to upsell you as much as they possibly can. There was actually a believe it was a school in Virginia that ended up buying, I think it was 40 times what they needed because uh, Cisco, Cisco recommended it. And so they bought it and now they have people that they have to answer to for such I, a I, nasty- I remember that story. You, you were talking about, uh, it was like libraries that all they needed was like a home router, just yeah. something to get on the internet. And they ended up buying these core routers that could serve out you know, 1,000 seat buildings. Yeah, and it was a tiny little town in what, North Dakota or Virginia or somewhere. And there was no way they could even use two of those with, you know, without, without looking absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> uh, Gerard, what about you? Same question. Someone comes up to you and says, well, why should I trust you? Aren't you just trying to get rid of whatever it is that you've got stored up in your warehouse? How would you answer a, a suspicion that you're not going to be completely honest about the stuff you're selling to them? It's a great question. And um, the, what you need to think about is that, as Gilly mentioned, we give you options. So we give you all the options and we tell you the pros and cons of all the options. And some of those cons may be deal breakers and some of them may not be. Um, you know, there are, when we talk about the different generations of equipments, there's sometimes only one reason that it was phased out or a new one came out. And a lot of times, those differences aren't relevant. Sometimes they are. We're up front with all the options and the, you know, the funniest cases are the ones where the previous generation equipment is better. But let's not, you know, confuse previous generation equipment with obsolete or legacy. Those are separate things. So we'll give you the options, whether they're, you know, current generation, one generation back or a few generations back and to help you make an informed decision. Yeah, I mean, there's there's certain amounts of, you know, as I said, FUD, but also the someone's going to recommend, you know, Cisco's going to recommend a 3750G, which has, you know, 48 ports of 10, 100, 1000 and four SFPs when they can get when they can get away with just a 10, 100 switch like a 3548. It's it's just a matter of putting their trust People have to make the leap and put their trust in us. And we have to prove ourselves. And if we prove ourselves, hopefully they'll come back. A good, good point. So basically what you're trying to say is you're not trying to sell hardware. You're selling, you're selling service. And actually, you're even more dependent. Uh, both of you, your companies are more dependent on having a satisfied customer because you want them to come back the next time they have a need. You want them to buy another line card for their chassis. You want them to buy their next round of switches for their deployment. So in a way, you have far more motivation to be straight and honest with the customers than, say, an OEM. Absolutely. That's exactly that's exactly right. We're we really want um, that long term relationship, and you won't get that with you know if you burn bridges. Yeah, and actually, they, I, I think Jilly needs to uh, pipe up a little bit. There, there's more than just two two um, used equipment dealers sitting at the desk right now. They're actually both on a organization I believe called Unetta. Julie, yeah. Let, Unita. Yeah, let's let's hear a little bit about that and about how an organization provides trust for used equipment. 
Okay, a little bit about UNITA. It's United Network Equipment Dealers Association. We are a group of networking individuals, resell the um, pre-owned, previously enjoyed equipment. That's our prime business. So we have the knowledge and we share the knowledge with each other. We were more of a, a team than we are competitors. If somebody needs advice, they'll post it to our list. Um, but mostly it's, we have um, our code of ethics, which means that we have to be up and up with not only each other, but we have to be up and up with our customers as well. Anyone can put in a complaint about us. And so far we've been pretty good about that. But really, really we are geared towards being the, the creme de la creme, if you will, of network dealers. We test everything, we warranty everything, and we help each other out. And I think, I think the, the family feeling is definitely very, very important in an industry like this. Because that, this way you know I can, I can trust my equipment that I purchased through Unita dealers. I don't get bad equipment in. And therefore, I don't sell bad equipment. Now we'll be right back with uh, with Gilly and with Gerard, but uh, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about one of our other sponsors here for this week in Enterprise Tech. We all know that Apple is a big part of the enterprise, and we don't speak enough about Apple on This Week in Enterprise Tech, which is why I'm happy that TechServe is part of the Twyat Riot. Now, TechServe is New York's premier authorized Apple reseller and technology provider, serving creative professionals at all levels, from individual customers to Fortune 100 companies. TechServe carries a full range of Apple products, from iPhones and iPads to iMacs, MacBooks, iPods, and accessories. TechServe also has a range of partnerships with top vendors to facilitate flexible, efficient, and creative solutions for all your business needs. TechServe assists businesses of all sizes to deploy Apple, Avid, and Adobe solutions throughout the United States. Whether you're already committed to iPads or just getting started, from sales to support, process to practice, TechServe can help. Some amazing technology solutions are already being deployed on iPads. If you've been to the Delta terminals in LaGuardia, Toronto, or Minneapolis, you may have noticed nearly every seat in the terminal is equipped with an iPad. Travelers can now sit anywhere in the terminal and receive real-time flight updates on the iPad or use them to order food, play games, browse the internet, and check email while they're waiting for their flights. Over 1.5 million visitors use these iPads in Delta's terminals just this past year alone. The result has been a double-digit increase in food and beverage revenue and the highest customer satisfaction scores of all participating airports. OTG Management is the hospitality company behind Delta's terminals. They've turned to TechServe to provide, configure, and install the world's largest deployment of iPads, a number that just keeps growing as they add new terminals. And TechServe really was the natural place to turn because they sell, support, personalize, configure, and manage massive iPad projects. From the Delta terminals to a school with 700 chef instructors to an operation that delivered personally configured iPads to 3,000 cable technicians. TechServe is able to do full lifecycle management for all your technology needs by providing the devices that you need, getting them up and running, teaching you and your staff how to efficiently use them, and maintaining them so that they're working effectively. TechServe also provides ongoing support so that if your enterprise has a problem, help is never longer than a phone call away. If you're considering adding iPads to your business, why not ensure the project's success with the world's most experienced partner? Now, if your business is considering integrating iOS technology at your workplace, then you need to contact TechServe today and receive your complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Visit TechServe.com slash Twyat and TechServe will help you assess your current and future iPad needs and give you advice to make it a success. That's TechServe.com slash Twyat. And we thank TechServe for their support of this week in enterprise tech. And we're back. Curtis, let me throw to you first because uh, we've been we've had a, a little bit of conversation going on here. And again, I don't think we're getting enough of the enterprise angle, which you can offer from enterprise efficiency. And that is this. 
We've been talking a lot about the dependability of the gear, about the service contracts, about enterprise cycles of deployment. What do you believe is the number one thing that needs to happen before larger enterprises are willing to, to, to go for solutions from someone like Subspace Communications or from Network Hardware Reseller rather than going to an OEM? Well, the big thing that they want to see is some indication that their risk is mitigated. Now, the things that we've been hearing about, uh, the industry associations, the track records, all of those are critical. And there is nothing, frankly, that works better than a reference from someone else, a, a peer who has had a positive experience. Anyone in business knows that this is generally the case. What they need to see is that they aren't going out on a limb. Let's face it, especially at the higher seniority levels, the, um, the CIO and one or two layers down, these are people who got where they are by being risk averse. And so to the extent that they can see that they are going to be getting gear that is appropriate to the task, that is well supported, and that is cost competitive in that ever popular total cost of ownership metric, then they'll be willing to look at these alternatives. And I think where we're starting to see is people choosing the, the secondary market for spot deployment. And that's really the opportunity for these vendors to come in and show that they are reliable partners, show that the equip equipment is fit for purpose, and that they can then be trusted to go into larger, more significant enterprise deployments. We're starting to see that, but face it, old stories, old stigmas die hard in a risk-averse environment. Yes, indeed. Uh, Gilly, I want to go over to you. We've got another question from Dr. T in the chat room who writes, when you do a full server room configuration, so someone comes to you and, and wants to deploy into a colo, uh, they want to fill up a rack, what would be your process for, for advising them? Would you give them, say, five different servers? Would you try to stick to one brand? What, what do you do to try to give your customer the best possible options when dealing with reconditioned gear? Well, the most important part is to listen. You have to hear exactly what they're saying, what three-letter acronyms they need the equipment to do, how many ports, um, what speed do they need firewall, do they need BGP. You know, you have to listen to the customer and assess from, ta from listening to the customer as to what they need. And sometimes it's going to be Cisco, sometimes it's going to be Juniper, sometimes it's going to be Brocade, sometimes it's going to be Lucent. You just never know until you actually hear what the customer is saying and you can give them several options. Usually most, most of the manufacturers have similar pieces. A lot of the difference is the price. Gerard, let me go over to you. Another question from the chat room, this time from Cap'n, who wants to know about that five-year time frame. He says his enterprise needs that five-year guarantee. So what would an entity like, let's say, Network Hardware Reseller do to make sure that you would have the repair parts in stock to keep to that five-year time frame? It's a great question. We offer a lifetime warranty on everything we sell. So if you have an issue, whether it's in a month or in five years or never you know we're going to be there you know ready to to help you um there is no you know time limit or anything like that and you know like as i mentioned earlier if you have even stringent more stringent slas we also have an additional offering you know that can get you that sla that really you want and you require uh, to give you the confidence in you know the support for your for your network Curtis, I want to throw back over to you. Uh, you, you were talking about uh, what needs to change in enterprise, and I think it's, it's, it's still very relevant. I, I want to ask the question about uh, well, when we're dealing with, let's say, that five-year enterprise plan that uh, Captain mentioned in his, uh, his chat room comment, do we really think that far ahead in the enterprise? I mean, I, I think, are we giving the enterprise too much, uh, too much credit here, or, or would the pricing difference be enough for them to make that decision? 
Well, do we think that far ahead in the enterprise? In many cases, the answer is yes. Uh, I talk to enterprise IT folks all the time who are still, for many of their infrastructure pieces, on that five-year cycle. They're planning that far out. They're buying for that far out. And perhaps most important, their financial systems are set up to deal with depreciation on a cycle like that. So for those, you know, major capital expenses, yeah, the five-year cycle is still very important. Now, with that said, most enterprises recognize that for the smaller pieces, for um, for branch office growth, for unexpected deployments, for the consequences of acquisitions or mergers, you've got to be able to respond. And I think those are the places where they're willing to be much more creative in how they fill the need. Those are, I think, perhaps not coincidentally, the places where they're willing to look at new partners and new opportunities for getting equipment at a lower cost in order to test out new relationships. So at the core, in the heart of the data center, we're absolutely still in the five-year cycle. Outside that, however, we're starting to see those cycles go down in size, down in span, and uh, in some cases become almost cloud-like in the elastic nature of what's going on. Gilly, I want to ask you a question. Again, I'm going to be mean here. Uh, there are going to be some components. There are going to be some parts, some pieces that will not necessarily be best to buy reconditioned. And I, I think this goes to the honesty of the vendor here. When would you turn to a customer who is coming to you for a solution and tell them your best bet is to not go with me for this particular thing? I actually have done that quite a bit. Um, a lot of times they want equipment that's too new to the market that it's not available pre-owned. So I recommend that they go to the OEM and say, listen, I've got, I, I'm interested in this product, but I'm also looking, I'm interested in this Cisco product, but I'm also looking at brocade. So what can Cisco do for me in order to get this deal? What kind of discount are you going to give me? And then you can go to Brocade and say, well, Cisco's offering me this. What's Brocade going to do for me? So my advice on the, if it's very, very new equipment, go to the OEM and see if they'll give you 60% off. Gerard, I want to give you the last word on uh, reconditioned enterprise gear. What would you say is, is the one message that you would want to get out to enterprise managers, to IT managers who are looking at deploying and weighing the cost saving of reconditioned gear versus that sort of going to save my job, uh, good, fuzzy, feel good feeling of new gear? Well, I, I think the bottom line is be open to it. Uh, listen to what we have to hear. Look at the options you'll be presented. And in the end, at the end of the day, you need to make the best decision for your organization, um, but I think that you'll find that the best decision doesn't always mean going with new hardware. Right, right. And, and just to let you know, uh, subspace communications, as I'm sure NHR as well, has a less than 1% return rate. Yeah, so it's, it's tested. It's pretty good stuff. Now, we will be right back. We're going to be talking about a brand new technology for pushing a lot of bits over the Internet. Plus, Chebert has a show and tell. But first, I want to get word from the last sponsor of the show and uh, we'll find out what they can offer for the, for the Twyatt Riot. We're in the middle of an exploding digital economy driven by software and nearly every company on the planet is becoming, in essence, a software company. Stash helps software teams take advantage of Git, the newest trend in development to write quality code quickly. Now, here's a few things that Stash can do for you. Stash provides a central place to create and manage Git repositories hosted on your own servers. It's the place where all distributed code comes back together, where you can find the latest official version of your project and keep track of code activity. Stash significantly reduces maintenance and gives IT administrators flexibility to control user management and permissions. Your servers, your rules. Stash supports your growing Git repositories within the safety of your own firewall. 
Stash's traceability and integration points allow your teams to follow their code from development all the way through delivery in one neat system. And now we all know that development isn't just about coding. Teams using Stash can quickly get a handle on which branches are affected by a particular bug and who's working on a fix. It can be a struggle to bring new technology trends into a large enterprise, but Stash enables teams to embrace Git using existing environments and authentication. With fine-grained permissions and code traceability, enterprise teams, all within the safety of your firewall, can work that much better. Enterprise code can be complicated, but administration is simple with Stash. Create a project, add Git repositories, and assign permissions all in a matter of seconds. You can avoid the overhead of managing Git for your team with an intuitive interface to add users and groups, create and manage code repositories, and a logical project structure. Stash fully integrates with Jira, understands what issues were fixed, and what code changes fixed those issues. You can track the progress of work being done on Jira issues. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit Atlassian.com slash twit for more information on Stash. Monthly plans start at $10 per month for up to 10 users. You can try it free for 30 days. Remember, Atlassian.com slash twit and select Stash. And we thank Atlassian for their support of this week in enterprise tech. And we're back. This time, um, I I'd like to get the panel's impression of a new technology. It's multipath TCP. I've heard that this was a technology that James Cameron used when he was making Avatar, and he needed to get his dailies across the ocean. And there was really only one way to push that much data across the internet at any given time. So he used this multipath TCP tech in order to get up to 50 gigabits per second. Chibert, you've actually got experience with this technology. It's called Digital Fountain? Yeah, actually, Kurt and I both did a uh, test of a digital fountain, oh, geez, maybe a little more than a decade ago. Anyway, the whole concept is instead of sending your data as a single stream, it channelizes into a whole bunch of different channels and will create as many channels as possible in the available bandwidth. The real key to what the commercial software does is that if the channels are reliable and the data consistently gets from point A to point B every single time, the digital fountain will actually drop channels out on purpose and mathematically recreate them at the far end. So in theory, if you have a fairly reliable link, you can get 150 to 200 percent uh, throughput over what the physical link provides you. Multipath TCP is taking this and taking the basic idea. Uh, it's also called swarm casting and doing reliable um, connections from point A to point point B, but channelizing it so you can get significantly higher throughputs. See, this is one of the things I don't understand. When we're dealing with a TCP uh, a connection, it, it's it's very susceptible to jitter. It's very susceptible to, to delay. And if you've got multipath, you're going to have packets that are arriving out of order, way out of order, way out of time. I don't understand how you do error correction for that. Well, a lot of this has to do with some research that actually goes back into the 1960s. And it was the Aloha channels uh, when we start getting into things like uh, Aloha Net and the origins of Ethernet. But the whole idea behind it is you're putting signatures on the data so that it's much easier to put it back together. And you're going to need a lot more buffers to be able to go and take all these different um, packets and make sure they come back into the right order. And because it's TCP, that means you have a reliable transport. So if you do lose a packet, you can actually ask for it to be retransmitted. Right. So what we're seeing on the screen right now is we're seeing the throughput as they add channels. Uh, now, is there an upper limit to this technology? They said they pushed it to 50 gigabits, but why wouldn't they be able to scale it beyond? Well, a lot of it has to do with CPU. How, you know, how much CPU does it take to put all these packets together? Now, if you start doing swarm casting on some really heavy CPUs or maybe even a cluster, ooh, now all of a sudden, wow, hey, Google Fiber in Kansas City moving data around really, really, really fast. Ooh, yummy. <laughs> <laughs> while, while Chibert has that little bit of uh, micro nirvana, I want to go over to Curtis. Curtis, in the enterprise, do you see a need for this kind of crazy bandwidth, 50 gigabits per second? It was used by a filmmaker, but does the enterprise have any data sets that could warrant a, a digital fountain for, for transfer from one part of the world to another? 
Oh, sure. And I think that you're looking for things ranging from software development uh, to moving big data files from one location to another, um, being able to localize databases for doing uh, ad hoc queries. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons. Now, most companies will not need this on a daily basis, an hourly basis, but there are times, it might be once a week, something on a scheduled basis, when this kind of, of technology can make a huge difference. And I think that's especially true in locations where perhaps the company doesn't have a solid lease line arrangement uh, where they're having to use some sort of commodity uh, internet for connectivity. Once you get into places like that, then uh, Digital Fountain can be worth its weight in gold. Right. Uh, let me throw over to our guests uh, sitting at the news desk, Gerard and Gilly. You sell hardware to customers who are often looking for this kind of throughput within the data center. You know, they're trying to connect one rack to another. but. Typically, we wouldn't expect to be able to do this over the internet. We wouldn't be able to do this over a, a long, large distance. It, do you see from your side, dealing with the end users, dealing with actual IT managers, that this is something even on the horizon, that you can get data center transfer speeds over the internet? Well, I think the you know shared, open, and all the other aspects of the internet make you know make some challenges. Um, within you know that type of model as opposed to the controlled environment of a data center um, but that's where a lot of these technologies come in is to you know find out what the weaknesses are in the in the transport and then figure a way around them to you know get the application which you know James Cameron in this case needed Kelly do you want the last word here because I know that if I don't give it to you you'll you'll beat me up <laughs> later and I, I, I don't feel like having that happen right um I'd say, yeah, it's definitely on the horizon. Um, it's just a matter of, of time and technology. Yeah, all right. That's, and, and actually, I think that's a really good axiom for Twite. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time and technology. Let's go on to our very last segment. This is my favorite part. T-Bird has brought a few toys into the brick house that he wants to share with all the good boys and girls. Now, T-Bird, what is this very first bit of gear that we see on the product camera here? Well, Beatmaster has already figured out that is a nook or nuck or who knows how you pronounce it. I'm, Intel, we need a glossary here so we know how to pronounce it, but it's spelled NUC, stands for next unit of computing. It happens to be a teeny tiny little computer you can see compared to uh, Vanna's fingers there. I mean, Jilly. Um, this one's interesting. It's a it's a quad core i3, 32 gig. I've added 32 gig of RAM. I've added 256 gig of solid state drive and a dual band um, Intel radio. It happens to be Bluetooth 802.11 A, B, G, and you know, all this kind of good stuff. What's unique though is that I've managed to troll through the uh, the blogs and so forth and found some very well hidden documentation on how to shoehorn Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1 onto that. Uh, Intel has actually modified their drivers so that it is not easy to install a server operating system on it. However, if you are planning on putting a workstation operating system like Windows 7, Windows 8, and so forth, it's easy peasy. Nice and small. Uh, I paid just around $600 for that on Amazon, and so far I've been really, really pleased. There's two models, one with a dual HDMI, one with an HDMI, and a... Thunderbolt. The, and the nice thing about that is basically if you've got enough memory and an SSD on it, it, it is not just a, a novelty server. It's a fully capable, quick, nice and uh, speedy server. Yeah, I'm planning on using that for trade shows so that I don't have to schlep a ton of equipment. I want to be able to just stick it into my check-in baggage and go do a trade show. Speaking of uh, schlepping, what's the next thing you've got over there? Well, actually what I have is a two. Um, there's, why don't we bring both of those sticks over. They're both Android sticks. One was from Kickstarter, um, the one that Jilly's got in her fingers now. That was a Kickstarter project, and it's from Infinitech. It's basically an Android um, stick that plugs directly into an HDMI port and gives me the ability to turn a regular old TV into a, something I can surf the internet with. The one next to it is actually kind of unique. That's the uh, iStick. 
I got that from PQ Labs. And that one's kind of interesting that it actually has a graphics processor in it. So what it normally is, is plugged into the HDMI on a 32 inch uh, monitor in my lab with a frame that goes around the monitor giving me uh, up to six points of touch. Whoa. So I actually plugged that directly and it just started up, gives me the equivalent of a 32 inch Android tablet. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's cool. I'm, I'm kind of sold. In fact, I'm stealing that. And uh, the very last piece of gear that you brought for our, our, our consumption, uh, what is this? Uh, that's actually the keyboard that came with the Infinitech. It actually has an accelerometer in there so that I can actually just wave it at the screen a la the Wii and be able to uh, control the uh, Infinitech um, or actually anything. It's a standard HID. It actually underneath that cover... Uh, that we won't need to take off. There's actually a little USB dongle, so you can actually stick that into just about anything that handles a USB mouse and keyboard. Yeah. Uh, Curtis, let me ask you about this, because we've seen this, this weird cycle of throughout the last three decades where we go from big iron to smaller computer, back into sort of centralized power, back into distributed power. Now, we've, we've got this big push to, to put services into the cloud, and yet we have products like these that are really sort of changing the way we look at how power can be carried around. Uh, what, why is this? Why do we keep going back and forth? Why hasn't there been that one-time move from either a, a, you know, a mainframe computer to distributed computing or back? Well, I think part of what we've seen is a redistribution of the power uh, we've watched the different eras of hardware capabilities leapfrog one another, uh, whether you were talking about the sudden ability to compute at all on a local basis uh, that the, P the original PC brought, uh, computing power that was, by the way, greater than what most people were seeing from a terminal where they were time sharing. Uh, in response to that, the mainframe people improved their products. Uh, the PCs got better. We, we've just kept going in this leapfrogging. And so much of what we're seeing is a response to, oh, we've got more power in this area. So let's now come up with the management style and the techniques to deal with that. I think what we're seeing now with the cloud is a return to the centralized model, but with devices that can browse and get to that data they have much more capabilities for improving the user interface. You know, Chibert was saying, you know, he ends up with a 32-inch Android tablet. That's great. But most people use that Android tablet as a window into the world of data that lives on the cloud and, the, frankly, the world of processing that lives on the cloud. Um, I think that the cloud really has started to break down the model. So now instead of having one or the other, we have a way to meld the two. The local devices, the client devices, can concentrate on giving us a truly powerful and rich user experience, while the big data storage and heavy duty processing takes place in a server farm where they happen very efficiently. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see how it develops, but I think that it is almost inevitable that in another seven to 10 years, we'll be sitting right here at Twyatt having a discussion about the next great model of computing and wondering what happened to the cloud. <laughs> exactly. We, we don't know, but you know what? When it happens, we'll tell you all about it. Well, you've gone and used up another hour listening to the Best Dang Enterprise show on the internet. I, I do want to thank our cast of characters here, the panel, who uh, ha has brought us actually some incredible information, some really, really good stuff for the average IT person to know. Uh, Chibert, let me start with you. I know you're here with me uh, for Interop. We're, we're chilling out in the Bay Area. But what else should they know about you or Thin Links or uh, any of the devices that you, you played with? Well, the whole idea is why should you carry something big and ginormous? It's really nice. You know, Thin Links is all about thin clients. Well, the thin clients come in iOS flavors. They come in Android flavors. They come in embedded Linux flavors. The whole idea is we're going back to the mainframe gang and we're keeping all the best features of the PC. 
Oh, I like that. All best features of the PC. Curtis, what about you? Still over in Florida, you're the you're the one person who's not in the brick house because you know what all the cool kids are over here. But still, what's going on with enterprise efficiency? Well, enterprise efficiency is continuing to look to bring the voice of the CIO to the IT world. And uh, speaking of that, if any of our quiet audience uh, is a senior IT exec who does have experience with some of these cloud issues that we've been talking about, either going to the cloud or looking hard at the cloud and making the decision not to go, I'd love to hear about it. Drop me a line, franklin at enterpriseefficiency.com. We'd love to talk to you. Gerard, let me go over to you because I called you Gerard Butler, but uh, now I want to call you Gerard Powers. What's going on with network hardware resale? Uh, and uh, I know it'll be over by the time this, this airs, but what is going on with network hardware resale at Interop? Um, at Interop, we are providing uh, both engineering support as well as hardware in both uh, switches and servers for NOC services and the uh, network infrastructure at Interop. And we're happy to do it again. Yeah, fantastic. And you, Gilly, I've known you for years as the crazy, crazy redhead who makes all the volunteers do what she wants them to do. What's happening with you or subspace communications? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing again this year. I'm making sure that the volunteers get as much out of the interop experience as possible. That includes taking classes. That includes asking questions, um, configuring gear, playing with the gear that's in the Network Operations Center. It's, it's very important that they get hands-on experience, not only for Interop, but for real world. Thank you. These are our techs. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to all of you for being on Twyet. Uh, we really wouldn't have a show without you. And you know what? We also wouldn't have a show without you. That's right, I'm pointing at you. If you're an audio listener, I, I'm speaking directly into your ear. If you didn't come to watch Twyet each and every single week, we wouldn't get to geek out like we do. Now, did you know that you can automatically have Twyet delivered to your device of choice? That's right, if you go to our webpage at twit.tv slash Twyet, you can find all the different ways you can have each and every single episode of Twyet dropped into your iPhone, your iPad, your Android tablet, your Android phone, even your zombie Zoom. That's right. We give you all the options you want because we want to give you, again, the best dang enterprise show on the interwebs. But we don't stop there. You see, we do this show live. That's right, each and every single week. On Mondays at noon, we come here into the Brick House and we try to create something that is, well, akin to a, a Best Buy beating up Cisco inside of Asana. I'm not really sure what that means, but you know what, it sounds dang good. That's why I want you to drop by at noon Pacific to live.twit.tv. While you're there, you can go ahead and jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv and speak to us. You've, you've heard me taking questions from the chat room. I, I actually do listen to what you're saying during the show. It's a great way for you to interact with us and with the wonderful people that populate the Twit chat room. Also, I want you to join us on our YouTube page. That's youtube.com slash twiet. While you're there, go ahead and subscribe so that we can get out each and every single bit of Twiet news to you, including when the very first next week, Twiet Hangout will be on Google+. Also, follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. There you'll be able to make comments about each and every single episode. You'll be able to suggest future topics. I actually take a lot of my topics from my Twitter feed. And you'll be able to follow me in the life of a digital Jesuit. Finally, I want to thank CyberDog in the chat room and everyone here in the Brick House who makes this show possible, especially my super producer, Karsten, and the TD who has no comparison, Mr. Jason Howell. He probably didn't train a camera on him because he's too shy. But Jason, tell us again, what should someone do if they wanted to say, I don't know, find out what Android could do for them in the enterprise? Twit.tv slash AAA, all about Android. Check it out every Tuesday evening, 5 p.m. Pacific. Absolutely. That's what you need to know. That's yeah, that, that really is what you need to know. <laughs> now, I'm Father Robert Ballaser. This is Twyet. And remember... If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.